Garada. And Daniel Garada. And I believe it cut me off again. This is Sally Wee Garada. And uh, we're from uh, the Arts and Letters show. And today we are talking with Kelly McMasters. Now, as you can see, these days Kelly can be found often sitting at her desk in a tiny bookstore just off Main Street in Honesdale, Pennsylvania, a small northeast Pennsylvania town, about 40 minutes north of us. Daniel and I first met Kelly when she was one of our editors at PC Magazine a number of years ago. The three of us have traveled quite far since then. Uh, to where I, actually, we've arrived at very similar places, both uh, personally and professionally active in all these years. Kelly's book, Welcome to Shirley, this book, I'm trying to get it on the screen, and I'm not, there we go. It's Welcome to Shirley, a memoir of an atomic town, was listed as one of Oprah's top five summer memoirs. That's pretty fabulous, Kelly. Thanks. And it is the basis of the documentary film, The Atomic States of America, mm -hmm. which was a 2012 Sundance selection. She's written for a slew of respective publications, including New York Times, Washington Post, The Paris Review, many others. She's also the recipient of a Pushcart nom nomination and an Orion Book Award nomination. Kelly teaches at MediaBistro.com and at Columbia University. Hi, Kelly. Welcome to Arts and Letters. Thanks so much. I'm so happy to be here. Hello. <laughs> We're delighted to have reconnected with you after all these years. Same thing. Uh, you're sitting in your bookstore right now. It's Moody Road Bookstore. Could you Moody describe Road. it to us? Sure. Moody Road Studios is down a little alley called Mod Alley. So we're a bit hidden off of Main Street in the small town of Honesdale, Pennsylvania, which is a really nice mixture of rural and artsy. It's a rural and artsy community. Um, that has been very supportive of opening a, a small bookstore. Um, where we've been open since November 2012, and mostly I focus on books that I know that I can promise people will enjoy. With Amazon today, it's impossible to compete. Uh, so what I can offer is if you walk in and tell me what your favorite, what the favorite book you last read was, I can give you your next favorite book. And I've read about 85% of the books in here, so, uh, and the rest come on good, um, very good recommendation or are brand new, so I just haven't had a chance to read them yet. But everything in here is top shelf literary and uh, promise to satisfy a good, necessary read. No, Given that you're up against the juggernauts of Amazon.com and Barnes and & Noble and they offer literally millions of different titles. Uh, why have you opened up a tiny bookstore that has just a, a handful of titles? Mm -hmm. Well, what I've noticed and what I had hoped would happen is that people in this area in particular, well, let me say I was in, I was in New York City for 15 years, where although the numbers have dwindled recently, you could, for a period, find an independent bookstore in each of the small neighborhoods in New York City. So I had it good. If I needed a book, I just went to the corner, or if I felt like I knew kind of what I wanted, but not exactly the title, I could go to one of the bookstores and look at the staff recommendations or the table with the new releases and pick out what I wanted. Up he when I moved up here, there are a ton of opportunities to get used books, so everything from church sales to library book sales to um, a used bookshop nearby to uh, yard sales. So books are here aplenty, and of course the library itself. But what I realized I was really missing was a, a curated selection um, and the smell of a new book. Um, I really took that for granted when I was in New York City. And when I knew what I wanted and I would order it from Amazon, it just isn't the same getting it in a package a few days later. Um, I am one of those people who could spend an entire day in a bookstore, um, something like 192 books in Manhattan, 
is one of my favorite haunts, and I could literally take an entire day and still not be finished just looking at what the special things they've selected that they know about that I don't know about. And I think when people go onto Amazon, it's almost too much choice. Um, you know, it, it's very overwhelming, and they have the algorithms to say, well, if you liked this, you'll like that. But I've realized um, those don't actually work for me. So if they aren't working for me, I bet they're not working for everybody else. And I think I have a better shot at besting that algorithm that Amazon has personally. You've written in your Paris Review column that uh, this bookstore gives you something of what you miss about New York City. Could you tell us what is it that the bookstore is giving you and that you miss? Sure. Uh, I had the good fortune of having a fantastic, thriving literary life in New York City. Uh, I went to grad school for writing there at Columbia, so I had this set of writer friends. I was a freelance writer in New York for a long time so, and an editor at different magazines, and so I had a great network of editors and readers, and I also ran the KGB nonfiction reading series where I basically was able to invite my favorite writers to come and read, and I got to meet them in person and read their books and help them promote their work. Uh, so I had this great kind of, and also classes. I taught, I teach at Columbia, and I was teaching at NYU and the New School. And so I really had this very full literary life. Um, unfortunately, New York is extremely expensive. Uh, and I also just fell in love with the rural rhythm of Northeast Pennsylvania and the beauty fall right now, so it really is um, the most beautiful time of the year up here. And when I came up, I knew I did have an artistic community here, but what's been amazing is since the bookshop has opened, and it has been slow because we are a little off the beaten path, you have to know about us to find us, um, our people have really just, the book people have found us. and. I've had everything from, you know, a poet who has kind of hidden out in the hills for years up here. He's got a MacArthur. He has a Guggenheim. You know, like really fantastic writers and editors and people who are voracious readers. Um, I started a reading series up here, so I've been able to invite my favorite writers up here as well with new books, and it's. I'm offering something different in the community because they're not necessarily um, the writers that would normally be coming through town here, and uh, so that's attracted people who maybe thought that they that they weren't um, there wasn't a place for them, and uh, I've just been able to build and also we're starting to offer classes, so I'm sort of creating a smaller version of what I had in New York in a way that works for the rhythm that works with my family these days. Well, obviously the um, uh, Moody Road Studio bookstore is a labor of love, mm -hmm. but is it also a successful business enterprise? Do you have a business plan or do you have a projection of just how it's going to pay for itself and possibly even turn a profit? I don't have much of a hope of turning a profit, um, but I do hope that it will pay for itself. Uh, in one of the Paris Review pieces, I talk about uh, how for the past 15 years I've been a freelancer, and like most freelancers, I'm always juggling five to ten jobs, so I'm still teaching, I'm still doing freelance writing, I'm still doing a lot of private editing for people who are working on book manuscripts or have have already um, turned in one draft and are working on their um, on their revisions, things like that, or book proposals. I do a lot of editing. And so I'm still doing all of that and just have the opportunity to create this sort of artistic community center in town. And so it's uh, it's been beneficial because it's paying in dividends not necessarily monetarily, but socially, artistically, and literarily. Um, it's also a great way for me to kind of retain my connections to the New York literary life instead of um, what I think can often happen is 
you get up here in these hills and they're so beautiful and you just get isolated and forget about the rest of the world. Um, I don't want that to happen. So I, it's, a, it's been a great way for me to stay in touch and kind of write these dispatches for the Paris Review about the bookstore. And uh, I think financially, once more people are getting to know us, they come in and they request certain books. If I don't have a copy here, they'll order from me instead of going to Amazon, which I think is a fantastic. And I, um, I really am grateful for that. Uh, and people are now coming here specifically for gifts or things like that. So I'm excited. I see, you know, an uptick and more people coming. So hopefully that will continue and uh, more and more people will get to know about us and will support us. Well, I have to say that um, we appreciate that you've created this community up here and we look forward to getting more involved in it. It's you're right, when we are sitting here in our studios, it's a wonderful place to create. It's a beautiful, beautiful area to create. But um, it can be isolating mm -hmm. um, if you don't reach out. And it's wonderful to find other writers and other artists, and there are quite a few of them, and then there are words, aren't there? Um, I'd like to switch gears a bit. Um, I just finished reading your book, Welcome to Shirley. Um, it's a memoir from Atomic, an atomic town. Um, more than anything, it's a very personal memoir about growing up in a close-knit Long Island neighborhood in the shadows of the Brookhaven lab. And I enjoyed reading it tremendously. Um, I felt I got to know you a little bit better through it. But as a writer, the one thing that you got to is something that is a particularly... Um, it's something that I often wonder about with memoirs. Uh, how were you able to remember such fine details from your childhood? How I think did you do that? I think that's a great question. Um, and I teach memoirs, so I have a lot of tricks and tips for meditating and pulling out memories from your brain, because it's all in there. It's just a question of what and how we remember. Uh, so. I also do this as a journalist. If I'm asking someone to, if I'm going to write something narrative, a journalistic narrative, uh, where I'm recreating a scene, for example, that I wasn't there, I'll interview somebody about it and I'll bring photographs or walk down that same street, um, listen to the music or try and smell that same food and really bring yourself right back to those moments that you're trying to recreate so you can get a full five senses, um, you know, reality that you're kind of stepping right back into it and then you can once you're once you've stepped back into it you can look around and and remember everything um, and you know some memories it, this story in particular was very important to me and so I'm not I don't remember everything uh, as a child but for a lot of what was in the book these this story because it's so an interesting and and intriguing and really means so much to me, those memories happen to be some of my strongest. And I'm an only child, which I also believe means as we grow up, only children don't have brothers and sisters to sort of bounce off of and to have other people take up the slack. And also they don't have anyone else to filter their memory. So they can't say, you know, what did Aunt Sarah give us when we were six years old? Um, if, if you're going to remember that, you have to remember it on your own. Mm -hmm. And I also am a consummate journal writer. Um, I had bundles and bundles of what began as diaries, as most little girls have, uh, and turned into journals that I could pull from. And I was also very lucky that a lot of the people that I'm writing about, I could go to an interview and say, hey, this is how I remember it. How do you remember it? And they would either corroborate or say, I totally forgot about that, or I have a picture of exactly what you're talking about. Here it is. And that would either, um, you know, assist or um, confirm my memory. And usually it was confirmed. There's a moment in the book where, uh, you know, memory is fuzzy and we don't remember perfectly. Our brains just aren't meant to. It's Everything is curated. 
uh, for our own life's narrative. And I did interview my father once about something, and I had a particular memory that I worked from his interview and wrote it down. It was the first night that we had moved into the house in Shirley, and he had said um, that the furniture hadn't been delivered, and we put out sleeping bags in the living room floor. And the three of us nestled down that night in our first night in our new house in Shirley and <laughs> left on the floor, which was a very romantic memory to me. I was four, so I didn't have any memory of that, uh, which is why I was interviewing him about it. And so I wrote the chapter, and then I gave it to my mother and said, you know, if anything feels off or if you can add anything to this, and her response was, oh, no, we definitely had beds that first night. Uh, <laughs> and so there are moments like that when you try and corroborate. But as a writer, I loved the narrative of that small family huddled together in that single space in the living room. So I wrote that in, and then I said, because I want to be completely honest with my readers, um, you know, it was very important for me to retain their trust. So I said, my mother remembers it differently in the, in the writing of it, um, which is something else I think memoir writers should not feel an onus to pretend that they can remember everything because nobody can. Um, so when things like that happen, I think it's even more interesting because they both truly believe that's how it happened. Obviously, one is right and one is not. There were only three of us there, and I have no memory of it, so there's no way to know unless... I get some moving records or something like that, but no, so I there agree. Have, there have been some famous memoirs uh, recently, actually, mm -hmm. that uh, the authors have admitted that uh, some of the scenes have been recreated or fictionalized because they were filling in gaps and they were trying to project or continue a narrative uh, uh, dialogue. Do you think okay. this is uh, valid? Or just should there be a caveat saying that this is a combination of what is true uh, memory and what is recreated memory? I think that's a great question. Um, to me, the, the relationship with your reader is the primary um, concern here. If you are promising your reader that this is nonfiction, it better be nonfiction. Um, a lot of writers today, in their author's note up front, say, you know, scenes have been combined, characters have been changed, or something like that. If it doesn't um, mess with the intention of the story, if the story still feels true as opposed to fact, um, and you're owning up to it, I do see a space for that, especially in memoir. Um, because it is just one person's version of the events. It's not being delivered as history. But when somebody, like what has often happened, um, delivers something and says, every word of this is true, and then people dig and find out it's not true, uh, what you really lose, the only thing you lose is your reader's trust. And then if you lose your reader's trust on page five, um, you know, they either aren't going to keep reading or they're going to question everything after that. Um, there is a, a great example, um, this beautiful book by John Degada, a writer I really admire and love, uh, called About a Mountain, and it's about the Yucca Mountain um, nuclear waste issue. And he conflates um, the date of a boy's suicide that he, that he makes the story uh, about. And it's, it's very small this little footnote, uh, and he says, you know, actually, the, this, I'm using a different date, but let's just pretend that this is the same date. Um, and it ruined the entire experience for me. And I, if he had, if he had said up front that this was not necessarily nonfiction, um, especially when you're working, like my book, in a vein of where you're talking about science, which, you know, that that is that has to be nonfiction. Uh, your reader has to trust you because you're delivering facts. Um, I think that that gets into really tricky territory or something like, you know, the age old, or not age old, but now it feels like it's been a really long time, um, but the James Cray incident, 
the reason that was so difficult is because so many, I mean, he changed people's lives when they read that book, A Million Little Pieces. And he basically was demolishing the 12-step program and saying, you don't need it. And so a lot of people trusted him and read his story and believed it and, and it impacted their, it had a lot of impact on their lives. So afterwards, when they found out, actually, this is nearly a novel, um, I think that it was the trust that was lost. That was where the anger comes from when you're, you feel duped as a reader. I think there is a way, there is a middle ground to own up and say, uh, to, to just on the page even say, maybe it could have been like this. I can't remember exactly, but this is what I think it might have been like. Um, or what I do in my book, for example, when I'm, um, when I'm tr kind of in territory where I'm not comfortable saying I know exactly that this is what happened. For example, the reimagined historical sections. I start mm -hmm. uh, paragraphs with, I imagine. Uh, and I feel like that's a more honest way to approach and still remain in the nonfiction territory because the beauty of nonfiction for me as a writer and a teacher is that it is this open frontier that can combine so many different things. Um, and that's why I'm a nonfiction writer and reader. Well, if I can get to the heart of the matter of the book, um, spoiler alert, it's yeah. about the high incidence of cancer uh, mm -hmm. near the lab. Uh, you obviously must be concerned about this for yourself and your family. Is that one of the reasons or factors that you decided to move out of the city into a um, relatively pristine country that's uh, you know, upriver from any nuclear power plants and is isolated from any industrial and chemical uh, uh, complexes? It definitely was a factor. I think the first factor was and anybody who has read my book knows this, I loved Shirley. I loved growing up there. It was a wonderful, warm experience. And when I started coming to Homesdale, I had a similar reaction. Mm. It's a small town. It's very close. The community is very tight-knit. Um, there's an amazing group of parents and artists and, and just the neighbors, that neighborly quality that I think for me was missing a little bit in New York City, which you know, you might have your neighbors in your building or the guy you get your coffee from every morning might know your first name, but there's also a kind of anonymity that as I grew older, um, I, I started to yearn for community. And so that was kind of the first thing that I was looking for. And then after that, I, when, I, when we found the house, the first thing I did was look up Wayne County in a Superfund database and there were, it was one of the few counties that I've ever encountered that had not a single brownfield or Superfund site in it. Um, so you're right to say it's pristine. It has its own histories of, there's some tanneries and um, you know of course we have, we've had coal and now fracking and things like that but so far, on paper, it was the first county that I've ever seen that had nothing, and it's it's a very sparsely populated place, so there isn't a lot of industry or anything like that. So that kind of confirmed, okay, this this might. I mean, there's always something wherever you are. There's always something, and um, a lot of people asked after reading the book, you know, why didn't you guys leave earlier? Why, did, why are people still living in Shirley? If you know that there are three nuclear reactors, they all leaked right into your town. Like, why, why are people still living there? But there's reasons for everything. I think part of it is being afraid. If you know what is in your closet, you know, what boogeyman is in your closet, knowing that is half the battle. It makes it a little less scary. And you don't know what might be in the closet in the room next to you, so you stay in your room. Um, and then... There's also that idea of comfort. The community was amazing and still is today. So I completely understand why people stay in places. And Shirley certainly isn't alone in this. In, in the film, we visit a bunch of different reactor communities, whether you're dealing with nuclear stuff or fracking or really anything. Um, it, it makes sense when there's a comfort level 
and you enjoy and love the place you live, home is such a strong, strong siren call that often there's no question of leaving. I was wondering about the movie. You brought it up. The Atomic States of America. Great title. <laughs> I don't know who came up with that one. Don Argot, the director. <laughs> it, it's a good one. How did it come about? Um, now, it's not actually based on your book, but it is based on your book. Was it actually an option relationship? Was it something that you instigated? How did it happen? Well, I, I have these fantastic film philanthropist friends, um, Joan and George Hornig in New York City, and they actually hosted my book party when my book first came out. And they, after Joan read it, she's a one of the smartest ladies I've ever met, and she is a great reader and had just a really intense reaction. They have a house on Long Island. She had an intense reaction to the book and said, I can see this as a movie. And so we explored the idea of a fiction film, and um, every person that we went to with it kept coming back and saying, I feel like this needs to be a documentary. And so uh, we had a connection who put us together with this amazing film crew, 914 Films, uh, pictures, sorry, 914 Pictures, and Don Argot and Sheena Joyce, uh, who did another fantastic film called The Art of the Steel about the Barnes collection in, yeah. or it was just outside Philadelphia, now it's in Philadelphia. Right. Um, less than a mile from us. Actually. Oh yeah, exactly. So you know all about that. And they, uh, their movie had just been in the New York Film Festival, so Joan and I went to see it together. The way they handled history, because we knew if we were going to do a documentary, a lot of it had to be in the past. So how would we work with the, this stuff that has already happened, that we're not shooting live stuff. And they did an amazing job um, bringing the history of the Barnes collection and that entire story to life, so we knew they were the right ones to work with. And then once we got together, once I got together with Don and Sheena, we just kind of hammered out, all right, what? how can we expand this and make this more important? And what we did was we used uh, Shirley and that story as kind of a microcosm or, or kind of like a launching pad and then we jumped from there into all these other reactor communities so the I, the feeling is this piling up that this is a story you know 75 percent of nuclear sites across America have leaked tritium I mean that's an insane statistic so whereas you know people would read the Shirley story and think well that could you know that's an isolated incident it would never happen anywhere else but it is happening everywhere else, and it was a great way to sort of bring awareness, look at the other communities, look at how the government is handling it, um, and and really question the waste factor, which I don't get into in my book, um, but we were able to get into in the movie, which is a huge thing, and then um, our future. And so it, I was, I sort of work as a narrator in the movie, and then there are other you know, really fantastic people from all the other uh, reactor sites who take us through their own experiences. Well, to sort of sum this up, Kelly, um, we're running out of time. How do people get in touch with you other than going to Homesdale and walking down a small alley and finding <laughs> your little bookshop? Well, that is the way I would recommend. Um, we're at 1023 Main Street. And we're in uh, right in between the milkweed stores. Anybody who's been to Homesdale knows Bill and Paul and their milkweed stores because they're just um, incredible stores that you can't pass by without going into. And if you you can either enter through those stores or through the alley right in between them, and just walk right back. We have a garden. You can sit and have a coffee and browse the books. Uh, you can also find me at kellymcmasters.com, uh, and my contact information is there. And you can also look for my monthly uh, missive notes from a bookshop at the Paris Review, and that's online, so anybody can access that. Um, and yeah, but I hope that people do come and check out the shop. And I highly recommend it because it is a charming, charming shop, <laughs> and it's a delightful place to just sit in your garden and talk about books. You, you have created something very special for the oh. community, and I thank you for that, Kelly. Thanks, well, 
This is Sally Wiener Grada. And, and Daniel, Daniel Grada. Let Daniel speak for himself. Of course. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> with Arts and Letters, we will be back again in two weeks. And thank you so much, Kelly. Thank you so much, guys. See you yep. soon.